I'm Terry Greaves. I'm Kiowa Comanche from Oklahoma. I was born and raised on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. I grew up on the Wind River Reservation in my mother's trading post. She had a trading post in Fort Washkie that she ran for over 30 years. And in her trading post, she sold mostly beadwork, although she sold stuff from all over the United States. Um, and it was crawling around behind those cases and cases of beadwork that I grew up. I, um, I was, when I was born, uh, there, my mother had a Kiowa, fully beaded Kiowa cradle board that was made for, my, made for me, um, and eventually my sister was in it. I was brought home from the hospital in beadwork, um, encased in beadwork. Uh, my mother had a beaded diaper bag. There was beadwork around me, and even everyday objects, things were beaded uh, around me. So it was in that trading post, crawling around behind the cases, that I was, that I was, I was enveloped in beadwork. And so from a young age, I wanted to try, try it, I think, curiosity and, and being around it. In my mother's trading post, she also had an area where she sold the materials, the raw materials for bead workers um, and for native artists in general. And uh, so I had access to the raw materials. So I think I probably started bead stringing maybe four or five years old. You know, as soon as I could pick up a bead, I was, you know, putting a thread through it and beading. Um, when I was eight years old, though, I asked my mother specifically if I could, um, I wanted to learn how to bead, to do bead work like I saw in the cases, to, like the bead work that she had around, her ho around the house. And um, she had an adopted auntie that was working for her, Zidora Enos, and she was the lady I asked her if she would show me how to bead. And Zidora sat down with me, and the very first thing she showed me how to do was hump stitch. Um, it's a single net needle technique. It's, uh, um, it's all over the plains, the northern plains and the southern plains. Um, and certainly Kiowas do it. It's one of the stitches that we do. The very first thing that I made was a pair of baby moccasins. Well, it was actually one baby moccasin, this baby moccasin. And um, the very first stitch that I learned how to do was this. It's, it's called hump stitch. My aunt sat down with me and she showed me how to do this technique. And I was so excited about all these little uh, triangles and diamonds that I had put in here. Then my aunt said to me, the design that you've created, it's in the beadwork, but it's not in the beadwork. This right here, the, the negative space, she didn't call it negative space, but this negative space, that's a deer hoof print. So from an early age, what I recognized about beadwork is that there's, there's the design, but it's the overall picture of what it is, that, it, that even the space that isn't filled informs. That was the lesson that I learned from that, this very first piece that I did. Sorry. The hump stitch technique is used all over the Northern Plains, and it's my understanding that it comes from quill work. Quill work is laid out in this linear way, but you can see the design, the pattern that's being made across here. This quill work translated very easily and readily into this hump stitch linear work. Quill work then jumps to this. These are done in lines. They're filled in in lines. And the patterns themselves actually resemble the old quill work designs. You can actually see in these moccasins that deer hoof print. That, that even though this is filled in, that that space is actually what creates those hoof prints. And this then is what I use on my tennis shoes. This is what fills in the background of all of my tennis shoes, is this hump stitch. This I did very much like a pair of traditional moccasins with this, at, this geometric design on there, made just like a pair, I would make a pair of moccasins. Um, the contemporary shoes that I do, the pictorial shoes that I do, I use hump stitch to fill in all the background work. And I use a two needle applique for the actual design work. These are Cheyenne women's moccasins. These are women only because of this design that's on here. This is a teepee design. This is actually the inside of a teepee design. I have heard that this is a map of the woman's placement within the teepee. So when she's looking down, she's literally looking at the map of where she should be. That way of entering into a sacred space, my understanding is that you walk in and you follow the path of the sun around. In all of my pieces, my larger object pieces, um, I make all of them so that they follow that same pattern. So if it's a three-dimensional object, you actually read it around this direction, the same way you walk around a sacred space, um, rather than 
reading it the way that you would read English. It's read, it's read in the motion of the, of the space that you move in, the motion of the cosmos. When I started beading as a profession, initially I was making, I was making things that many Native people make. I was making utilitarian objects. I was making bags and purses and, and uh, accessories and you know things that you would adorn yourself with. Moccasins. I was I've been a moccasin maker since I was a little girl. Um, and what I realized was, and it was specifically with the shoes, I realized that I could tell a narrative with, the, with my work. And that um, unlike Kiowa, traditional Kiowa beadwork, which is mostly abstract, that I enjoyed doing pictorial work. What I realized with a, with a pair of shoes was that you can read them, they don't have to match, and that they, were, they became sculptural to me in a certain way. So that you, it was an object more, more than a, an accessory that you wear and that you could read them, that the stories flowed around them, and, um, and that I could, I could tell a pictorial narrative with them. Like that elk up there, that's Northern Plains beadwork, that's what I grew up with. I had started off beading history, because I've always been interested in history. So there would be a historical question that I would ask myself, or that I would be contemplating. Um, Medicine Lodge Treaty, the last treaty that was signed in, uh, between the Kiowa and the US government. What does that Medicine Lodge Treaty mean? Uh, how was it signed? Who was there? What were they discussing? What were the terms? How was it? How was it broken? Um, all of those things. That was so. That history. The 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 where we came from. Our my great Kyle migration. Those those historical moments. Those were the moments that I was interested in illustrating. And it really came out of my personal curiosity of like what like what why, and then. Uh, I became a mother and I had uh, my first son and after I had my first son I realized that I was his first teacher and that what he was going to learn about Kiowa was the way that I had learned about Kiowa people through my mother and that I'm, I was literally giving him those first notions of his identity and who he was, who his people were. Um, and so then I realized I needed to tell him stories and those stories were the stories of our origins our, our spiritual life, um, they call it myth or legend. I don't, I don't subscribe to those terminology. It's, um, those are our stories. Those are, those, those are almost, in a way an American can understand, a biblical story, right? Those were the stories of who we were. And those were the stories that I started illustrating on all types of objects for my children. And really it was about, um, I would make these drawings that were going to go on whatever object I was working on. And um, then they're, my drawings are very simple line drawings that I do. And I would make copies of them before I, was, before I started sewing on them. And I would take them to my little kids and I would, they would be coloring book pages for them basically. And they would color in whatever it was, the sun boys or whoever it was that I was illustrating. And then at nighttime I would lay in bed with them and I would be telling them, them the story so that they would fall asleep. And, I, and I, it was the, those stories that I was telling them. And it was actually at one moment when I was laying in bed with them and I realized how much my kids love the Spider-Man, Superman, the hero stories, that I realized that we have those hero stories too. And that those, the, that hero story, well, I realize now is a universal story, right? And that, our, that the Kiowa version of that, the Jesus story, the Muhammad story, the Buddha story, that that story, we had that story as well. And, and that's when I became really interested in illustrating our, our sun boys, our half boys. And that those beings, those, those cosmic beings, that became a focus during their childhood. Um, and getting, I guess, kind of giving the, the foundation of who, who they come from and what our cosmos looks like where we go when we pass on, where we come from, where we came from, those, all those stories, that's what I was interested in. So then um, from that evolution, then um, my kids were growing up and they were less interested in mom telling them stories in bed and I was having more time to um, think about other things. And um, uh, I realized like with my mother um, being such a strong influence in my life, my sister, I actually come from a family of women, the, my grandmother, um, was one of four children, only one son who passed away really early when he was a teenager. 
um, that and and she had girls. She only had two boys out of all of her children. And um, my aunt only had girls. My mom only had girls. That I come from a family of women. And so who, like, what I realized was is that I didn't feel as hamstrung as maybe my non-Indian counterparts felt as being a woman in America, like a modern woman in America. And my curiosity then was driven by, well, why? Why do I not feel as hamstrung by these ideals of patriarchy or whatever that uh, my counterparts are feeling? And it was because I grew up in a community that valued women in a way that that was not valued in the larger world. They had a voice, a real, live, powerful voice, just like my mother, just like I witnessed with my mother. Even in the American Western world that we lived in, they still, in their own communities and in their own families, they had power. And so I've been driven, really, by that notion. Well, it's a notion of femininity, right? A notion of being a woman, being a female. Um, I get asked all the time about how I started beating Converse All-Stars. I was not the first person to beat Converse All-Stars. When I was a young kid, a teenager, in my mom's store, um, a Lakota lady came in and um, had a pair of fully beaded All-Star Converse, like high tops, um, for sale. And my mom bought them, and my sister and I thought they were the most amazing shoes we'd ever seen in our lives because... They were beaded with very traditional designs on them. They looked like moccasin pattern designs on them, but they were modern day shoes. They were tennis shoes, like the kind that we would wear. So it was the perfect combination of contemporary object with, tr with a traditional feeling to it. Well, my mom had the store here in Santa Fe and she said to me, well, Terry, why don't you try to beat a pair of tennis shoes? I'll send you a pair of tennis shoes and see if you can beat them. I thought she was crazy. I thought there's no way that was the biggest object that I'd ever even attempted to bead and I didn't even know if I could do it even though I had seen them and uh, I worked on them and the very first pair I made were made very um, much like the first pair of shoes, uh, tennis shoes that I saw which were they had a very um, geometric moccasin style pattern on them. The second pair of shoes that I made um, were actually a commission from the owners of Jackalope and she wanted for her partner a jackalope on the side of it and turned out I could put a jackalope on the side of those shoes and from there I realized they were pictorial then the third pair of shoes actually I leapt where I realized that they were objects and that they could be red I realized that they didn't have to match the way that moccasins matched um, that you could read the inside to the outside or the outside to the inside that they could you could walk around them and spin around them and it was at that point on those third pair of shoes that they, I guess in my mind, they almost became sculpture. And that's when I stopped seeing them as actually shoes that you could wear. These may have been like the fourth pair that I ever made. And you can see they have this really very moccasin style design on them. This was how I thought about them initially until I realized I could put pictures on them. So there's a couple of reasons why I use, me personally, why I prefer to use chucks. For one, there's a technical issue. This tongue can roll up into the toe so I can get my hand all the way up into this edge. The second reason for me is what I realized after I'd made a few pair and I'd shown them in public. People would approach my shoes and I would have a pictorial story on them, some important pictorial story that I wanted to get across. They would come up to my shoes at, in public at an opening or at a market and they would come up with laughter, with a smile on their face. And initially, I was offended. I couldn't understand why they were laughing at my important work that I was doing. And then I realized, oh, well, then I would tell them the story. And they would walk away with a piece of American history that they had never heard before, some concept that they'd never known or whatever it was, some I, something about Kiowa people that they didn't even know who Kiowas were. And they walked away with that knowledge. And what I realized, and this is the reason why I will continue to do Chucks, uh, specifically Converse, um, they are familiar. In America and acro across the planet, you've either owned a pair of these, your kids have owned a pair of these, you played basketball in these, you had good times in them, you did your own little graffiti on them, you've worn them out, you've had multi... They are familiar. And this familiar object is a perfect vehicle for me to tell a story like that, to tell a story that may not be that easy to tell for that, or that easy to hear. 
And that's why I, I continue to use the All-Stars because people walk up to them with a smile on their face because they recognize them. And then I have this little opening and I can give them a little bit of information. My thought process to this was, I'm going to have a pair of shoes in a, in, a, in a museum that's going to be in the public eye. So I can tell a story, a, something that maybe isn't heard on a, you know, in a normal basis or in a normal space. Um, and so I, there was a couple of things I was playing with, but I landed on that, uh, and this is my own personal moment right now in, my, in how I'm thinking about my work. I realized that I want to continue to talk about abstraction in American art and where abstraction in American art came from. Um, and it is my view that American abstractionists, when it was created in art, were looking at the primitive arts of the world. Um, and in America, they were specifically looking at native women's art. And in fact, for Kiowa people, our women are the abstractionists. And the men are the pictorial historical painters. So when they do a winter count, they're painting little figures. Um, but the women were abstracting the world. And what were, they what were they painting on? They were painting on parflash, right? They're painting on rawhide containers. What were those rawhide containers? They contained the most important things of that family. The ceremonial clothing, the food, the medicine. All of those things were the things that were deemed important enough to be contained in these rawhide containers that were painted with the world abstracted. So I think that's a phenomenal thing. I think that long before Georgia O'Keeffe ever set foot in this country and painted her first abstracted flower, those native women were painting the world abstractly in pigment, on hide. And so I know that there's a link. I know that there's a link in art history. There's a link in that continuum of human expression. And that comes from women, that, that, that abstraction, I really think, is a feminine ideal. So that's what these shoes are about. It is my wish, my hope, my prayer that these shoes put forward the idea that abstraction is a feminine ideal, that abstraction at least in North America, started in women's, with women's hands and women's eyes and in our minds and our hearts, that that's where that, that came from. Beadworking is an act of resistance. I, I, I had initially wanted to go into law because I wanted to fight. I wanted to fight the fight. Um, and what I realized now as almost 50 years old, that beadworking is an act of resistance. My grandmother did it. And she had a sixth grade education. She was not well educated. She was considered labor, menial working. She picked cotton, she washed dishes. But she beaded her entire life. And she was recognized for that. She went to Gallup ceremonial. She went to the Oklahoma State Fair. All of that time, she was recognized for what she brought to her community, the cultural knowledge that she held and she was able to give to people to and communicate with people. And so what I realize is, is that even though, like I think of my, you know, you can think of my grandmother as some uneducated Indian in, you know, Oklahoma territory or whatever, she was in her very essence resisting through the act of what she was doing. And I feel like that that resistance carries through me. And every stitch I take, every bead I lay down is an act of resistance. So um, in terms of the market, my grandmother was not able to make a living doing beadwork, but she certainly supplemented her income doing beadwork. And this was back in the 1930s and 40s when beadwork was considered trinkets. You know, it literally was considered trinkets. It was not considered art. Art historians didn't even consider it art. Anthropology was just collecting it in terms of collecting the dying North American Indian, I guess, you know. At this point, beadwork is becoming considered a valid art form, a medium itself, um, is incredible. And I'm, I am, I know this, absolutely blessed because in my grandma's day, it was not considered this. In my mother's day, it was not considered this. One of the important things that I want people to recognize, and this comes as 
with those shoes in terms of thinking about abstraction. Um, beadwork is just a medium. It's just a medium. It comes from Europe. Beads to this day come from Europe. They're not indigenous to here. But in our hands, beads have become native, right? The medium itself was taken from Europe. And it now, if you were to go to Africa or China or Germany and you were to present these, people would know that they're Native American. Why? Because of this beadwork that's on them. And I think that's an incredible thing that as, as Native people, in many parts of the United States, we were able to take a European made, medium and make it native. Being a part of that continuum, being a part of that story, that long history of the medium itself and, and the history of expressing our, who we are through the objects that we make, that's a, that's a really, that's a blessing. It's a blessing. It wasn't until later on that I was exposed to the wider art market that I, then, then that's when I was like, okay, there's a hierarchy to how they see this art uh, that comes from Europe and it comes from whatever. I did a piece about, specifically about that, the tension between art and craft, and um, it, it was a non-functional two-dimensional piece, beaded using Czechoslovakian glass beads on brain tanned deer hide, but it hung on the wall and had no utility, and in it, is a profile of a Native American in a war bonnet, and out of his mouth is a voice bubble that says art. But I took that voice bubble from Lichtenstein, because Lichtenstein in 64 was contemplating the exact same thing. What is art, right? And I, that particular year, every interview that I had with a magazine or whatever, they were all the reporters, I don't know if it was like a consortium of them or what, but they were all asking the same question. Do you consider yourself an artist or do you consider yourself a Native artist? And I, I couldn't stand that question. And I, I know I answered it in various ways, but it just, it was one of those questions that stuck in my craw because I can't peel my identity away from my voice. Are you a white artist or are you an artist? Are you a Chicano artist or are you an artist? You know, like, are you a black artist? I just, I was like, how, you, how would, why are you asking that question? It just seems so kind of, so like 1800s, I don't know. It was like, what is that? So that particular piece, um, the idea of making a non-utilitarian object that had, that it was not useful and it was specifically, so what is art? Because what you're telling me that what I do is craft and therefore it's not high art or fine art or it shouldn't hang in a museum next to or whatever or be placed next to whatever. I know the depth, I know the depth of what my people are and how they are able to express themselves because I know that I don't know what they're talking about. I know that when I look at those old pieces, I'm talking baby talk because the language, the ability to speak through their medium is so deep, it's beyond what I can grasp. Those things were not taught uh, unless you were there and present. Many of that way of understanding is, is not, like we don't even know, it doesn't exist anymore. That's deep. That is as deep as any Raphael hanging in any, you know, museum in Europe. That level of understanding of your place in the world, who you are, how it relates, all of that stuff is embedded in these objects. All of that way of, that language of understanding ourselves is embedded through that medium, from paint to beads. My mother's outfit, that red dress and all the pieces that go with it, took her 50, 60 years to come together. And our clothing is like that. Um, contemporary Native clothing oftentimes can be made by the same maker and it matchy, matches all the way down it. My mother did not like the matchy-matchy that was a, what is now considered contemporary powwow clothing. What she understood, and this comes from you know, a lifetime of dancing and a lifetime of doing ceremony, our outfits come together through love. So every piece that is brought to, into your outfit, the dress is made, was made by her. She made that dress for herself. I helped her put those elk teeth on there. I helped her with the beadwork around the edging. My sister helped her with the teeth as well. The... She waited a long time before she got that belt. 
She hunted for a long time before she found the right maker for that belt. Her leggings, those were her favorite leggings. Those leggings she wore to my son's naming ceremony. She wore at my grandmother's memorial dance. She wore them to dance at IAI powwow. So our outfits, and this was how she always taught, she always told me, our outfits come together in pieces and they're given to us, they're purchased, they're traded for, but every one of those pieces that you put on, they all have a story and they all have meaning and they're all about you specifically. So it's not an interchangeable thing. You can't, I couldn't put on my mom's outfit. That was her. She put that together. That whole outfit was her voice and who she was and how she appeared to the world and how she presented herself in, in, a, in, a, in our traditional space, right? And that's how I put my outfit together. My buckskin dress that I wear, my sister beaded it, my mother made it. She sewed it together. And it was presented to me when I graduated from college. So that dress, I don't ever want to see it in a museum. That dress I plan on being buried in because that dress is my dress. It belongs to me. It was made for me. And that's how her outfit was. That, or that's how her outfit is. That's how my outfit is. And, and that's how I've always created my children's clothing as well. They're, they come together no, not always by the same person. It's not, about, it's not about walking down a runway. It's not about a competition. It's it, oh, everything has a meaning to it. So my mom, being Kaiwan from the Southern Plains, um, she was Kaiwa Princess in 1954, and that's when she graduated from high school, was in 54. It was about that time that powwow started. So my mother was dancing at the very dawn of the powwow culture. And in large part, boarding schools where you have a whole group of kids from a bunch of different tribes and they get together and they're missing home and they're singing songs and um, and then the powwow culture as we know it now has evolved so when my grandma was dressing her sons to dance what they wore as fancy dance outfits looks so much different than what is now worn right and when my mother started dancing there was no shawl dance there was no fancy dance for women there was no fast dancing for women. It just did not exist. So my aunt, her sister, would dress up in her brother's clothes, her brother's fast dancing outfit, and would go out and compete and dance with the boys. And my aunt and her cousin used to win so many of those competitions that eventually they were banned from competing because they were winning against the boys. And it was out of that desire, that athletic desire. My aunt was a basketball player. Her cousin was a basketball player. These are athletic girls, right? They're, they're physically strong, you know, girls that wanted to express themselves like this. And um, out of that, that's where fancy dance, that's where that shawl dance came from. That did not exist. In 1954 and 55, when my mom was princess, there was no shawl dance. That just didn't exist. And this is where as a bead worker and as a maker, you get recognized. I may not be the greatest dancer in the world, but my beadwork is really good and I get sought out by, non, by other Native people that, that want a piece of my beadwork to wear when they're dancing. And for me, when making a piece of beadwork, any piece of beadwork, I revert back always to the intention of why I'm making it. So even when I'm making something that's for sale that I don't know who it's going to, I have that prayer involved in it. This will provide my family with money for food. This will provide my family with the you know the uh, roof over their head.